Happy Sabbath, everyone. We thank the Lord for giving us this opportunity to come before him that uh, we may continue with our studies on Advent Farmer series. And uh, the Lord will want us to learn greatly about our farms and what we need to do in these last days. So I just want to pray and then we get into the study of today. Loving Father, what in heaven, we thank you for your love and mercy for us. As we want to delve in this study, Lord, we pray that your spirit be with us. Thank you for hearing us for this humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we want to we want to look at uh, pest and disease control. This is a class that many have requested for a long time. That what should we do in our garden when we are infested with pests, with the half aphids, and a lot of destructive pests? I want to tell you that. The Lord always has a way for everything. Uh, only if we follow the divine plan that he has set in the Garden of Eden. So I'm going to share with us some of the, uh, some of the, the tricks that we can use in our garden. But well, first of all, the principles that we need to understand in order to be successful in uh, controlling pests and diseases in our farms. Remember that we are living in a very sinful world and the devil is trying all his best to make sure that we are discouraged and we are controlled and we become uh, his snares and his slaves. But God's people ought to be like the sons of Hezekiah who are 200 and they knew what to do. They taught the children of Israel what to do in the time that they were living. And so God's people also in the last days ought to know what to do during a crisis. And number one, we realize that God is calling us to have farms and gardens. And in areas that are not affected in the rural mm -hmm. districts, or areas that are not affected by the artificiality of life. So we also discussed that for us to succeed in good farming techniques, we have to set our farms in the right place and protect them by uh, dressing them well with compost manure and also natural trees that will be able to bring compost or life humus into the soil. So there is cast in the garden. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15, the Lord God says to the children of Israel that if it shall come to pass, if thou will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I commanded thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Curse shall thou be in the city, and curse shall thou be in the field. Curse shall be thy basket and thy store. Curse shall be the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep. Cast shall thou be when thou comest in, and cast shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee casting, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand unto for to do, until thou be destroyed, and until thou perish quickly because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me. So when we forsake the Lord and we say that his ways are difficult to follow, then we cannot succeed in fighting the uh, depraved soils. And so in 3SM 329.2, 
fruit trees must be sprayed that the insects which will spoil the fruit may be killed. God has given us a part to act and this part we must act with faithfulness. Then we can leave the rest with the Lord. So we were given dominion over every creature and over the earth. And so we need to be very, uh, very responsible that those pests that do not make our soils and our plants to grow well needs to be eliminated. And we need to eliminate them through the right plants and methods that God has given unto us. Because these days we have chemicals that have been used as pests and pesticides and herbicides that have caused a lot of uh, deleterious effects in our cells and our bodies. And so people are becoming sickling and sickling. But we need to come up with methods that are going to work that are so that are healthy to our bodies so that we can build strong immunity. For us to succeed in controlling pests, we must learn what is known as companion planting. It is planting many things, mixing them up and planting herbs, vegetables and flowers together and watch them grow. I, I, I told us that we must look at the forest and see how the forest behaves and what makes the forest not to be affected with the pests and diseases because of the plants that grow together mutually affecting the life of each other. So our gardens for us to be, affect, to, to be uh, able to overcome the pests and the diseases we must know which plants, which flowers, which herbs we ought to plant together with our vegetables and our fruit trees to enable us to expel pests. And also when pests are expelled, the diseases will not be able to thrive in that environment. So the companion, uh, companion planting is where we plant diverse or different plants like flowers, herbs that have a uh, pungent smell or strong scents that are going to expel the pests away. So there are principles of companion planting that we need to know. Like number one is crop rotation. We must know how to switch every bed every year so that there is no uh, expression or continuation of the pest attack in the subsequent uh, plants that we shall uh, grow. And this help us also to protect the, the, the soil from the, in, uh, for, for the invasion of the, of the virus, the bacteria and the fungi that cause diseases to the plants. So this principle ought to be understood and we ought to know which, when we are for protecting, what principles do we need to follow? When we plant a type of a, 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 a species or a family, a certain family of plants, the next season, we need to know what other plants we need to put in place. Uh, so like tomatoes is very, very uh, vulnerable to uh, blight and blossom and rot. So we need to see the best plant that we can rotate or we can plant together with, uh, with tomorrows to make sure that they are not affected. Yeah, so we must understand the botanical plant families to know what is best and what is right. The botanical families will help you to know how these plants complement one another. Like we have the alliums, that is the garlic family. They have pungent smell, a lot of sulfur, and they are very good in expelling pests and also developing the soil. And then we have the sunflower family where we have the chicory, the lettuce, Jerusalem artichokes and sunflowers. They also very good in attracting insects and, and good 
uh, good pests. Uh, I call them pests, but uh, good uh, predators. We call them so that can feed on the on the insects and pests that destroy our plants. And then we have the the call or the cruciferous family, the brachycicus uh, family that are also very vibrant. They grow vibrantly. And then we have the carrot family or the parsley family where uh, we have the celery, the chavil, the cilantro, the dill, fennel, lovage or parsley. All these have the part they play when they are mixed together with other crops. And then we have the squash family. The squash family is where um, is where we have the, um, the cantaloupes, the cucumbers, the pumpkins, the watermelons, and the zucchinis. If uh, we also have the, we also have the legumes like beans, peas, peanuts, soy, night uh, shade, or the tomato family where we have the eggplants, the ground cherries, tomatoes, papers, potatoes, tomatillos, and we have the spinach family, which include the beets, the Swiss chard, and spinach. This, when we understand how they grow and how they are, some are strong to, are proper to mix them with the plants that are vulnerable to diseases. Like for example, in our gardens, one of the best methods we can use to control uh, to control and expel pests is to plant the allium family, the lilies, uh, the, the, the garlic, the chives, the leeks, the onions uh, in our gardens, basically in all the fruit, uh, the fruit garden, fruity garden, and also the vegetable gardens. You just plant uh, the the garlic or the onions in between our uh, elder skeletal around the farm to make sure that the, the spurgeon smell will be able to uh, uh, to expel a lot of the pests that shall come. And you'll also realize that the carrot family that is not affected by most of the pests can be planted together with the brassicas so that when when the when the plant when the pest comes, they will not really know their favorite uh, favorite plant or crop to feed on. We normally get the farm, the whole farm affected because when the pest come, they go to the specific crop because that is the only crop that is being grown. But if we want to succeed by not spraying a lot of chemicals in our farms, we have to. Uh, do this companion uh, farming. Uh, we must know the heavy and the light feeders uh, for this is going to help you to know how you are going to fill in the right type of plant that is going to accompany the other one. Um, you need to understand the one that fixes nitrogen into the soil the ones that helps in breaking down the soil clothes, the ones that are helpful in, uh, in uh, attracting uh, predators or attracting pollinators, so that this uh, companionship is going to bring a lot of productivity in your farm. So you need to understand the heavy feeders and these heavy feeders, uh, Baby feeders or light feeders, you must know them well because they are going to affect your soil biology as well as the, uh, the soil texture. So you will also be looking at the root depth. The root depth of various crops differs drastically, like radishes and spinach have relatively shallow roots. Uh, by comparison, the roots of a squash plant can dig down as far as six feet so deep tap roots pull buried nutrients up from the soil. They will travel much deeper than any a double digger and they won't require a shovel. 
They exemplify how your plants can work the soil for you without ever having to deeply till. So this is the best way that even if you are cooperating, if this season you plant maize in a certain area, next season you need not to plant maize. You need to plant uh, things like uh, um, skuma wiki or the kales or the carrots so that that, inter that, that, that uh, symbiotic relationship or health is achieved. Uh, the green tomatoes can be mixed together with the borage uh, so that uh, the borage is very potent in expelling pests. And it also helps in breaking down the soil. Borage also helps to sweeten <laughs> to concentrate some nutrients that will make your, uh, your fruits to be sweet, like potassium. They concentrate, concentrate a lot of potassium in the soil. So you need to plant your farm with a lot of borage and borage will be uh, acting as a pest repellent as also, and also as a, a potassium fixer in the soil. So principle number two is interplanting. You need to consider uh, growth rate in interplanting. When you are planting, you need to know which plants grow very fast and which ones grow very slow, which ones are very vigorous and spreads very fast. Uh, so those that are spread very fast uh, over our area, like the vine, the vine crops need not to be uh, planted together with short or plants that do not grow very tall. So those that are having vines like pumpkins, the, um, the pumpkin, the, um, we have uh, the, the, the cucumbers and, and uh, watermelons need to be planted together with plants that are tall, for example, like uh, you can plant eggplants or tree tomatoes and uh, cucumbers so that they are above the, uh, the, the spreading vines. So radishes take very short time. So if you know the growth rate, then if you interplant, you know that after such a time, uh, for example, if after one month, my radishes will be ready. If I plant them with pumpkins, the pumpkins will have not covered them or my watermelon will have not covered them. So you need to know which ones take the short time so that they can utilize the space that is in place. So the broccoli, beets, cucumbers, greens, lettuce, uh, spinach, turnips take 45 to 60 days. The beans, bush, and fall, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, collard greens, and peas take 55 to 75 days. The melons, family, the eggplants take 68 to 85 days. And the Brussels sprouts take 80 to 90 days. Fennel, pumpkin, and sweet potatoes and onions take 100 to 110 days. So when you are interplanting, you must know that the one that takes short time can be planted with the ones that cover the soil very fast. And the ones that take long time need to be planted with uh, the ones that are taking short time so that uh, they don't actually compete for nutrients at the rate or the time when they are fruiting. Yes, we must also understand the plant nutrient requirement. You must understand which plant are light feeders. Light feeders, they mean, it means they take little nutrient in the soil, like beets, carrots, garlic, horseradish, Jerusalem, artichoke, leeks, onion, potatoes, and radishes are light feeders. They don't need a lot of manure. They can basically grow even on a on a bare or a barren soil and still produce. We have the moderate feeders, like the, uh, the, the cruciferous family, 
they basically need some of the nutrients. They cannot do well where there is no nutrients and the soil is not aerated. So like if you have your cabbages or kales, they need to be planted together with the light feeders and they go together because it will, uh, the light feeders will not take a lot of nutrients from the soil. And then we have heavy feeders, the artichokes, the broccoli, celery, corn, cucumbers, eggplants. This needs a lot of nutrients and deep soil so that they can be able to maintain their growth. And then we have soil builders, peas, beans, and soybeans, alfalfa, red clovers are very beneficial in restoring the soil structure. So like the soil builders can be planted basically by with, with all, every type of plant. And then you need to understand nutrient needs. While eggplants can rely on rich soil to generate large fruit, lettuce will still grow in soil that has been depleted. Peas and beans add nutrients. Heavy feeders should be rotated with soil builders and light feeders to give the soil a chance to rebuild its supply of nutrients. If heavy feeders have occupied a bed for most of the growing season, spread a nutrient-dense cover crop like crimson clover in the fall to replenish the soil. Heavy feeders like maize, like uh, um, the sweet potatoes, Irish potatoes, when you have planted them, you need to replenish the soil again. Most of the times we fail to reproduce because we just plant and next time we just uh, plant again. But that should not be so. The soil needs to be fed very well. And this also goes to our fruit trees. Most people, once they are planted their fruit trees, they don't remember of replenishing this, the, 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 the crops again. And so once they are planted, the fruit tree takes about three or even five years, it has not actually received more nutrients. And so you will find that they develop very long tap roots going into even uh, about 100 meters to get, for, get nutrients. It should not be so. If you have a fruit tree, you need to be replenishing it after every three months, you add more nutrients you add more compost into it. Uh, if you have harvested your vegetables, you need to keep adding more compost or more uh, manure into the soil to make sure that the health of the soil is restored. Remember that if your soil is having enough nutrients, enough compost, enough humus, it will, not, it will be able to fight for itself because the, its immunity will be very strong. You must also know the available sunlight when you're doing companion uh, planting. Uh, make sure that the tall trees are not competing for the vegetable because the vegetable are short. So the tall trees should not be competing with vegetable for light. The vegetable should be on the Eastern side and the, 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 the trees should be planted on the northern side or on the eastern side, no, not on eastern, on the western side, so that they don't uh, bring shade in the farm. Uh, because your microbial, uh, microbacteria needs a lot of uh, warmth for them to operate as well as some plants need a lot of sunshine. So make sure to plant, to plant the garden according to a plant's final height at the end of the season. Like Jerusalem artichokes may start small, but they can reach up to 10 feet in height. They and other tall or trellished plants should occupy the space on the northern side of the edible beds. So all the edible, and the tall plants or trellished like tomatoes that are, are growing very tall needs to be put on the side that, uh, that 
like, like to the northern side that will not block a lot of sunlight. The vining crops often perform better when they are trellished to grow upwards. Squash and cucumbers will grow naturally towards the sunlight they crave. Crops that prefer partial shade like spinach and cucumbers can occupy the space below uh, or under the shade. So you make sure that even your plants that need to be supported, make sure that you support them. And once you've harvested, don't burn your, uh, don't burn your plants that have, uh, that have been harvested. Make sure that you plow it back into the soil or have a, a compost pit where you put the, uh, the, rem the remnants so that you keep replenishing your garden every one month or every three months. You need to know your locations. The location will help you uh, to know exactly where to plant the tall trees to the northern side or the western side, the short ones should be on the lower side, the eastern side. That is tomatoes can be done well with, uh, uh, with marigold, with lemongrass, with rosemary, like with sage, with mint, be it tropical mint or, or chocolate mint or spearmint. All those can be grown together. You can also do it with borage. You plant borage around the farm, pork root around the farm, or you intercrop them with your tomatoes. Tomatoes, watermelons are very, very delicate. You cannot succeed if you plant them together. If you plant it in one row, the pest will overwhelm you. So the only safety for us to have tomatoes that are not affected with pests and diseases is to intermingle them or plant in between rosemary plant or Mexican marigold or borage or lemongrass so that it helps you to expel the, uh, the pests and diseases because the pests are the ones that bring the diseases they bring viral and bacterial infection. Then we have to plant in the principle number three, plant intensively. When seeding vegetables and transplants in the ground, pay careful attention to their spacing. Mulch should be applied to the soil to surround the transplant while they are still small. Once the crop reach their final size, the ground floor of the garden bed um, should be longer be visible, should be no longer visible. If one plant will be harvested, harvested before another in the same bed has even begun to produce, have an idea for the crop that will follow. So this is called successive, uh, successive planting. You need to know the months that they take to grow. Like if you want to have your vegetable constantly uh, after Every month, you need to be planting another one. For cucumbers, every one month, you need to plant another, uh, another, another bunch. And they need not to be much if, unless you are going to sell. If you're going to sell, you will have to put a lot. And things like watermelon, after one and a half months, you plant another round so that throughout the year, you produce plants that are enough for you and for the whole family. You need not to run out of your vegetables. By don't, don't wait until you have harvested all your, uh, all your vegetables is when you begin to plant again. By the time they are beginning to shoot up, put another nursery and put other seedlings so that they be able to be replanted after a short time. So principle number four, Flowers and herbs belong in the edible garden. They need to be planted everywhere. The roses, the hips, uh, the hops, the Mexican marigold, the lavender, uh, all those need to be planted together in the farm because they will help you to make your farm look very beautiful and at the same time protect your crops from infestation. 
herbs like sage, herbs like uh, um, like borage, herbs like spearmint, all need to be planted around the farm. So principle number five, a companion planted garden extends beyond the garden borders. So it only it doesn't only depend on these herbs and flowers, even the trees around your farm. I told us that if we want to survive the cross-pollination that is taking place in our borders, we have to plant trees like cypress, like pine, like cedar, like pithonia, like bottle brush to help protect the blowing of the, uh, of the pollens across our farms. So uh, plants that are easily cross-pollinated, you need to put them in the middle of the farm to protect you. And should you choose to plant, let's say a maize garden alone, you need to surround the farm with the cypress trees or with a bottle brush to help you protect that overgrowth of the pollens. In summation, when, uh, when preparing your companion plants, uh, planted beds, don't abandon the fundamentals of gardening. Healthy garden soil is the literal and figurative foundation for any companion planted garden. So companion plants need water, sunlight, and loamy soil that is overflowing with microbial life. Make sure that your farm is always lively. Don't allow your farm to be bare make sure that they are always mulched and compost added. And then we can now go to the organic fungicides that helps to control disease. So organic fungicides include sulfur, copper, are considered synthetic, allowed with restriction in some areas. And uh, uh, most of the Fungicides that are inorganic in the market are made of sulfur and copper. But you can get this natural sulfur and copper uh, in the companies that make them, and then you concentrate them, then you spray them on your plants. They will be able to remove any fungus. Uh, like you can have uh, oil made from uh, oil made from garlic, oil made from cloves are very helpful in supplying sulfur and copper for your plants. And they will protect it or get the powders, the powder, sulfur powder, copper powder, mix it with essential oils like um, um, lemongrass oil or uh, garlic oil or onion oil, and then you spray them on your farm they will be very, very helpful in controlling the pest. We have the Bordeaux, uh, the Bordeaux mixture. It's a mixture of copper sulfate and hydrated lime used as a fungicide in vineyard. It is used to control infestation of fungi and downy mildew on trees and vine fruits and nuts. Small amounts can be made by mixing four or about eight tablespoons of hydrated lime in, in eight liters of water. Mix four or eight tablespoons of copper sulfate in one or four liters of water, and then pour the copper sulfate mixture into the lime mixture. Strain through cheesecloth, about, add about uh, 42 gallons of water, and then add the sulfate mixture use immediately. It is very important for, uh, for, controlling, for controlling the, controlling the, the pests and diseases. Or sometimes you can apply potassium bicarbonate with a sodium bicarbonate with any soap. For example, if you don't have potassium bicarbonate, get the sodium bicarbonate and add add uh, soap, it may be liquid soap. For example, if you have about um, a quarter kilo of potassium bicarbonate, you will add about a liter of 
any liquid soap and then you add uh, like 10 milliliters of any essential oil and then you also add like uh, like about a half a kilo of washing soap washing powder um, and then add about 20 liters of water let it sit for about three hours and then after three hours you put it in your spring uh, your sprayer and then you spray the plants it is always good to spray in the morning we have diatomaceous earth is a product made from the fossilized remains of diatoms and diatomaceous earth will help you to control things like slugs things with hard shells in the farm they will shrink the shell uh, the, the soft part of the of, of the of the pest and then they are eliminated from the farm you need to use spray oils and in spray oils we can have the peppermint oil the uh, the cinnamon oil we can have um, olive oil as a mix as a carrier agent we can have clove oil all put together eucalyptus oil in the same ratio for example for 10 liters you will have like 10 milliliters of each in the 10 liters and then you add potassium bicarbonate or add a surfactant like uh, uh, olive oil and then shake well and then you can spray in your vegetables you can also use neem oil and neem oil should be of the highest ratio in this mixture uh, you can use like uh, about 30 mils of, of neem oil with the 10 mils of each essential oil that you have in, uh, in like 20 liters of water and then spray in your farm. You can have liquid copper fungicides. Now fungicide, the copper fungicide is helpful in uh, plants that are affected with uh, with the blight, for example, we have uh, we have um, oranges. Oranges these days are affected with uh, with the black mildew, and also with the pests that the green pests that insects that eat the the leaves. What you can do is to use a copper fungicide. You just go to any 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 agrovet or any hardware that sells the farm uh, farm 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 based uh, uh, I can call them powders like the lime or the gypsum all those kind of uh, of powders and then if you can get even sulfur you mix them together for one kilo of copper fungicide goes with one kilo of uh, of um, of sulfur you mix in 20 liters of water let it stay overnight in the morning you'll have to add uh, some things like paraffin one liter of paraffin and then you you sieve it and then put it in your put it in your sprayer box then that will be able to be helpful in controlling the fruit more so the citrus fruits are affected by the fungi and copper fungicide is very important for controlling them sometimes you need to pour that copper fungicide on the roots to help protect your citrus fruits and also you realize that we have a problem with the uh, fusarium rot uh, in uh, or wilt, sorry, fusarium wilt or blight in the bananas these days. What do you do if you are faced with such a situation? What you need to do is 
if you have your seedlings of bananas that are affected, you have to use sodium bicarbonate and uh, let's say a half a kilo of sodium bicarbonate with, uh, um, with about one kilo of wood, of wood ash. Put in 20 liters of water and then soak your plant, your banana plant in that solution for about three hours. And then after three hours, you will put it in the hole and then you cover it up. You will be able to solve the problem of the banana uh, fusarium uh, wilt or blight. Another thing you need to do with the bananas is to keep rotating, keep transplanting so that the whole plants are not affected. So we have liquid sprays, oil sprays that I've just said, uh, where we use the cooking oil or any, any oil like uh, um, olive oil mixed with the washing agents and essential oil, the potassium bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate mixed together and then you put in your spring box and this will go with about four liters of water, four liters of water sprayed in the morning. The neem oil will be also very important because it's a broad spectrum insecticide. It controls insects and mites, including white flies, aphids and, and scale, control fungal diseases, including black spot, rust, mildew, and scab. For indoor, outdoor use on, uh, use on ornamental plants, flowers, vegetables, trees, shrubs, fruits, nuts, and crops. No surfactant is needed with neem. So you don't need uh, things like uh, uh, cooking oil there or olive oil. It is better used alone. So that is so helpful. Neem is very beneficial for many, many diseases, even in men in treating many diseases. So this is what we, we have today. And many people can be blessed by this presentation. What we need to do is that when we put all that God has given us into practice, God is able to protect our farms. Make sure that you are so prayerful. Make sure that you give tithe and the fast fruits to the people, uh, to, 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 uh, to, the, to the ministers of God, or you can share them the fast fruits with uh, the needy in the society so that God keeps blessing your farm. You don't need to actually just forget God. But if we remember God in all things, we kneel down to pray, God shall be able to protect our farms. Remember Jesus Christ, when he was dead, when he was dying on the cross, they put on his head a thorn, a crown of thorns. And in the beginning, remember that God, when he cast Adam, he said that thistles and thorns shall eat bread, uh, sh shall eat bread. But at the cross, we see the restoration of everything, including the soil, the blood that, uh, that drip into the soil was an atonement even to the soil and giving up to the farmers of today. And every farmer who will follow the principles of health and of soil hygiene, God will be able to bless them. You need to be among the people who are willing to be used and willing to follow uh, what God is saying in this end time. We need a people who are going to stand as a bridge in the bridge to make sure that the world is given the best because the world is in a crisis. The world needs Christ, uh, Christian missionary farmers. Christ need homes that are going to present the life and the restorative mechanism being 
are people who are rescuers of the world. May God bless us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your blessing of your word. We pray that all that we've been doing in this presentation may be a blessing to the hearers, even those who have not found time to join now. Later on, let them be blessed with it. For this humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.